So uh, we can just dive right in here uh, in just a moment, and I'm going to pull up my notes here. All right. Well, thanks so much for uh, being with us virtually uh, as so many things go uh, these days for the meeting of the Capital Preservation Committee. Uh, as vice chair of the, co the commission, um, acting as chair uh, in the governor's absence, I will now call this meeting of the Capital Preservation Commission to order. Um, I determined an in-person meeting was not practical because of the current health pandemic and ongoing peacetime emergency declared under Chapter 12 of of Minnesota statutes. As is permitted under the open meeting law in these conditions, this meeting of the Capital Preservation Commission is being conducted uh, on a virtual video call, and in the unlikely event that a vote would be needed, it would be conducted by roll call. The purpose of today's meeting is to hear updates uh, about the maintenance work that has occurred on the Capitol building over the past year. We will also review the 2020 annual reports of the commission, which will be submitted to the legislature in January of this coming year. And will we also hear from the Capital Area Architectural and Planning Board Executive Secretary, Paul Mandel, with a brief update about the two advisory task forces that were formed this past summer. Um, but before we jump into the first agenda item, I also want to note that uh, the four public members of the Capital Preservation Commission will be announced soon and uh, will be present for the next full meeting of this group. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Chris Given from the Department of Administration, who will update us on uh, the maintenance and preservation activities that have occurred over uh, the past year. So Mr. Given, please go right ahead. Uh, Mr. Given, you are on mute. We cannot hear you. Good morning, Lieutenant Governor and there members of the commission. My apologies for unmuting. I've got two mute buttons. I am Chris Given. I am the Director of Facilities Management for uh, the Department of Administration. Uh, we operate and manage the facilities on the Capitol complex and the grounds and parking as well. So it's my privilege this morning to talk a little bit about uh, what we've done over the past year around in the around the Capitol building and on the grounds with the leftover or the remaining restoration funds that were appropriated over several years uh, in the uh, through the 2010 decades. And then we'll uh, highlight the report. So I'll go ahead and start and just to refresh everyone's memory or for those that weren't here back then. Uh, back in 2018, the legislature amended the capital preservation funding authorization for 2013, 14, and 15 to allow for unspent funds to be spent on other restoration asset preservation work uh, on the Capitol building and on the mall. And uh, as kind of a brief history, we received money over several years for the restoration effort for the Capitol building, starting all the way back in 2012, where we received $38.2 million. And that was primarily to do some dome repair work. where We replaced the drum windows uh, in the dome that year. Uh, in 2013, we received $109 million. And that was really the first increment for the full uh, effort restoration project that took place. Uh, back in 2014, we received $126.3 uh, million to supplement that original funding and continue the work on the restoration effort. In 2015, we received $32.9 million, and that was for some additional repairs that were discovered as we were about two-thirds of the way through the project. We discovered there was some plaza work that needed to be done because there was some leaking under there. And it was also to improve around Aurora Pro Promenade and also to put in some security enhancements adjacent to the building. And then finally, in 2015, we received $3.25 million uh, in leg legacy funds for the art restoration in the building. So that grand total comes up to about $309.7 million or $310 million. So that's the full increment of funding that we got for the building over the years. So there's some money that was not spent and we were therefore authorized by the legislature to take on some other initiatives. If you might remember, we put in the uh, ADA ramp uh, on the south side of the Capitol a couple of years ago. 
and last year we we finished a couple of projects that were still just kind of uh, wrapping up as part of the original restoration effort. Uh, we installed and commissioned some new microphones in the house chamber. We finished that early last year. And also in the house chamber, we finalized commissioning the lighting uh, system so that we could have them at different levels while we were in session versus while we were out of it. The, the lighting controls had to be adjusted. So we wrapped those up early last year. And then really our main effort uh, for 20, calendar year 2020 was to do some repair uh, and maintenance on the mall. You know, the mall has 23 uh, uh, monuments, memorials, and one tribute on it. And, and, and they really represent the valor of the state of Minnesota from all different backgrounds. And over the years, of course, in facilities management, we do do day-to-day -day maintenance. We keep the, the landscape manicured. Um, and we do minor maintenance and repairs, but we're not really staffed or funded to do major wholesale deep repairs. And so we utilized uh, four point, it was, uh, let's see, it was roughly $3.4 million to enhance or, or repair most of the monuments, 16 of the 23 on the Capitol complex. Uh, some may have seen where, for instance, the Women's Suffrage Memorial, the uh, the foundation wall was badly deteriorated to the point where some of the plaques were threatening to fall. Just needed a lot of the monuments needed to be cleaned up and refinished because they were starting to oxidize and that kind of work was done. So it primarily consisted of uh, mason repairs and replacement where we might have had some uh, grout uh, between the, the the masonry blocks that had come undone. Uh, we retuck pointed to make that look uh, you know, almost like new in some cases. Uh, again, we we cleaned the monuments. We applied a, what they call a wax coating on them. Uh, we did some major re-landscaping. Again, in facilities management, we'll replace a bush or a tree here or there and keep the flowers, uh, you know, manicured. But we don't uh, necessarily re-landscape for severe overgrowth. So we did a lot of that on the Capitol uh, Mall to make those monuments uh you know, look uh, like they should. And so that uh, the many people that we get each year on the mall can come and enjoy those. And so that's really what was done. We wrapped that up early this uh, or late this fall uh, in the early November timeframe. And uh, so we think we've got several years now of good uh, um, sustainability or sustainable monuments out there. So that's the work that was finished. As of this date, we still have $2.4 million that remains uh, available. It's uncommitted. Uh, part of the legislation that went on back in 2018 was it extended the, uh, the date to the cancellation on the funds. So these funds are good until December 31st, 2022. So we still have two more years on them. Uh, so, you know, right now we are in the middle, and I'll talk about it a little bit in the report, but we are doing a decorative paint study inside the Capitol building because early after the restoration was done, we were noticing that there was some peeling going on in vestibules. And we've seen some peeling now over the Grand Stairway, uh, the East Grand Stairway uh, in the Capitol. And so we have conservators in there now taking a look at that. So we suspect we're going to need some of this money to take care of that. It's not a reflection of poor workmanship on the res restoration uh, crew uh, or team, uh, you, you know, over the years, a lot has been done to that capital from, you know, 2000, uh, 1905 till now. And so there could be areas of bad plaster that were put in in the 30s or the 40s or some bad paint that underlies what's there now. And so we're studying that and we'll fix that. I don't have an accurate cost. We've estimated about half a million dollars, but it could be less or it could be more. So we're going to see what the conservators say when they wrap that up later this uh, winter or early spring. Beyond that, you know, um, we do do annual surveys on the building. It's still in pretty good shape, and I'll get into that in a second. Uh, but we never know what's going to pop up. So we could be using that money on something to keep the building in, in top condition. So really, that's the end of the report on what we did this year in the May in in the in, in the realm of restoration type work. I'll talk about day to day maintenance and things like that. But this is work that is appropriate for use for the bonded dollars, and that's what we did to the monuments. These were significant repairs beyond day to day, and that's what we utilized uh, some of the unobligated funds for. 
Great, thank you so much, Mr. Givens. I think we have a, a couple of questions from members. So uh, I am first going to go uh, to Senator Rest. Uh, please go right ahead. Um, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Um, sir, with regard to the um, microphones that were replaced in the House, what, what is the history currently of um, the microphones in the Senate? Have ours been, um, um, were ours uh, brought up to date in the 2016 um, uh, restoration or what is, um, what's the status of them? And then uh, I can follow up. Uh, Senator Mr. Rest, I, I will find out. I don't believe that they were touched as part of the restoration. I haven't received any word <laughs> from the Senate that there are issues, but I will follow up. I, I can't give you a d definitive answer if they were actually replaced. I do not believe that they were. But, um, uh, but sir, uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor, sir, mm -hmm. um, the, um, the funds for the replacement of the microphones in the House did not come from the House budget. It came from capital preservation funds. Is that correct? Yes, Senator Rust. Yes, Senator Rust. Um, in the rest, in the placement of those new uh, microphones, uh, <clears throat> members of the Senate are very envious of the ability of uh, members of the House to directly participate uh, in floor debate, um, even when they are participating remotely. Um, that right is not given to members of the Senate. The only thing we can do remotely is um, vote aye or nay, or uh, maybe some person's name. Um, were those microphones equipped at the time that they were put in place to allow remote participation, um, active remote participation, or were they, um, um, or is that just a, a feature of the um, advanced technology in the House that the Senate does not have. Mr. Gibbons. Uh, Senator Rest, uh, that's something I'll also have to check on. I believe it's part of the new technology with the new system that was put in. And that's why it, and it almost confirms that uh, the microphones in the Senate were not touched uh, and they've got the old technology. Um, well, Lieutenant Governor and and Mr. Gibbons, um, um, the members of the Senate that are on the Capital Preservation um, Commission, in particular Senator um, Kent and myself, uh, we would appreciate a memo from you detailing um, those technology updates, and perhaps we can um, ask for similar updates and uh, to be able to exercise our rights to uh, participate in floor debates. Thank you very much, uh, Lieutenant Governor. Appreciate the time. Thank you, Senator and Mr. Given. That is noted if you could provide that, that memo. Thank you. Uh, we've got quite a few hands here, so I'm just going to keep uh, keep going. Uh, Mr. Whitworth, go right ahead. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Um, I uh, absolutely think that the Commission and the Department of Administration are wise to think to the future and to anticipate uh, maintenance and preservation needs uh, ahead of time. And Mr. Givens referenced some premature peeling of the decorative paint. Um, and I believe they've got a decorative paint study underway to examine that paint. Um, my point here is simply to make sure that the commission members have artwork on their radar screen, so to speak, uh, particularly the works of art that are affixed to the walls of the Capitol and that were part of the the uh, preservation project. Um, the Minnesota Historical Society uh, will work with the Department of Administration as issues emerge. And I just want to make sure that all of us on the commission are aware of future cost implications of any of these needed repairs. So just, just to uh, reinforce the, the importance of us keeping an eye on the artwork as part of that project. Thank you, Mr. Whitworth, uh, noted. Um, and uh, we know that uh, it's incredibly important to keep up the maintenance and make sure that we are protecting our assets. Uh, Mr. Given, do you have anything to, to add there? Uh, 
Lieutenant Governor and Mr. Whitworth, uh, absolutely, we're, we're prepared to work with the Minnesota Historical Society on this. Uh, there have already been discussions about one mural that is showing some distress. And so uh, we are coordinating with you there as to, to determine where the lines of delineation are. I'm interested in the building and its infrastructure to make sure it continues to stand. But certainly we want that to be able to, to hold true, to hold whatever artwork is there as well. So there have been some initial discussions with uh, Brian Pease, the site manager for the Capitol building, and we'll continue to have those discussions to come up with a resolution. Lieutenant Governor, Mr. Givens, thank you. I appreciate you working yeah. with Brian and your sensitivity to the artwork that was part of that preservation project. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm now gonna turn it over to uh, Representative Torkelson. Please go right ahead. Well, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, just a real quick question regarding the funds that are set aside uh, for this work. Is there any delineation between those funds, between what's used outside the building and what's used inside or on the building itself? Mr. Given. Uh, Representative Torkelson, uh, the Lieutenant Governor, uh, no, it's all bondable. That's uh, the monuments are part of in lieu of rent uh, account, which really has nothing to do with bonding. Those are bonded funds. Uh, that's all infrastructure out there. And so we are using the, the funds that were allocated for the capital restoration on the, the outside stuff as well. The, the work that was done on the plaza, uh, Aurora Boulevard, that was all part of that same bonding conglomeration of bills over the years. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant Governor, if I could have a follow up. Absolutely, go right ahead. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, and uh, thank you for that answer then. Who makes that determination? I mean, as we, uh, these funds aren't going to last forever. Uh, how do we, who's determining what gets used where? Uh, Mr. Given. Hey, Senator Torgelson and members of the committee, commission, um, at this point, uh, the, the Department of Admin has been, uh, you know, given the custody of those funds and any, the, the way the statute reads is any use of those funds has to be approved uh by minnesota management and budget so we do know based on the the statute that it is strictly for asset preservation type work i mean we can't build anything new with it uh, we can't repair necessarily a motor or something like that it's got to be asset preservation type work on the capitol or the grounds the capitol mall representative torkelson i uh, thank you that concludes my question Thank you. As a former House member, I was going to make a comment about demoting you, but I won't do that. Oh, did I? <laughs> did I, oh, I my apologies. I, I was going to. I was going to ask, today. Uh, Lieutenant Governor. I was going to ask if I had to give up my microphone. <laughs> my apologies, Senator Torkelson. That's fine. Uh, um, uh, excellent. Okay, uh, Senator Nelson, please go right ahead. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. It is really encouraging to see what all has been done uh, in the Capitol. And um, some of us on this uh, call started uh, this in uh, back, I think, in 2011. Uh, Rep. Erdahl and I uh, started that um, ca this Capitol Preservation Commission, and I see Senator Rass, Senator Pappas, all were parts of that. And it's really, I think, a time to really rejoice and see what has been done. It is so, so beautiful. Um, my question um, had to do with the um, repair of the monuments. And I, I think um, Rep Torgelson started to, to get to that point. Um, what is the uh, mechanism and the manner for determining um, which monuments get repaired and when. Uh, we know that any new monuments have to have a perpetual uh, maintenance fund, but of course we have many historic monuments that uh, predated uh, that requirement for a perpetual uh, maintenance fund. And and so of those uh, older um, monuments uh, on our capital grounds, what is the process then for determining um, what gets repaired and when? Mr. Given. 
Senator Nelson, uh, members of the commission. Uh, we did a study back in 2012, and that was the genesis for the work that needed to be done. Um, we hired conservators to take a look at every one of the monuments and to come up with a list of requirements to, to bring those monuments up to, you, you know, good repair. Uh, we had monuments where, you know, we we thought that some of the structural elements were going to be failing soon. So we, we, we undertook this study, and that has been the document that we had used over the last three to four to five bonding sessions to try to acquire bonding funds to make those repairs. And uh, at some point during the restoration, um, somebody had the foresight to say, you know what, let's go ahead and use some some of the remaining funds for this. And so the conservators back then uh, had a priority list for us to follow as to what the, the most pressing repair is first. Uh, and that's basically what we followed when we went into the pre-design and the design. Of course, that was uh, adjusted based on what had transpired deterioration wise over the years, but that's what we followed. A couple of the monuments, uh, you know, were actually the ones down on the south stairs were taken care of, the tuck pointing and things of that nature were taken care of as part of the work that was going on on the plaza. But that's what we followed, Senator Nelson. Oh, thank study. you. And, and just a follow up, Matt, uh, Madam Chair, please. Go right ahead, Senator. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Mr. Gibbons, well, the um, that report, that uh, itemization probably occurred before the destruction or the um, or the defacing uh, and taking down, quite frankly, of that Christ of our Christopher Columbus monument. And my question is, uh, where is the Christopher Columbus monument on that um, maintenance list out of that remaining two point four million dollars? I believe at one of our cap board meetings, it was revealed that it was about $154,000 to repair that monument. Now we've already had the, the legal proceedings, uh, the, the folks who are involved in that have received the legal treatment as deemed uh, by the courts, but we have not yet addressed the restoration of that monument that was taken down um, against uh, any laws or, or cap board policies. And so where is that now on the list of repair? Mr. Gibbon. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Nelson. Uh, well, the Christopher Columbus Monument was restored as part of the restoration that uh, along with the other two that are on the south side of the steps. So it had been recently restored, the, the, the monument itself and the support. Uh, as of right now, it is at a safe, dry location in the metro. It's a combination MnDOT slash DPS facility where it's uh, inside uh, waiting for disposition, the, the decisions of the cap board. Senator Nelson. My recommendation would be that it be included as one of those monuments that should be restored with the 2.4 million that is left over from the capital. Um, from the capital restoration. And if it's not this board, um, certainly I'll be glad to take that up at the cap board. Noted. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Executive, Executive Secretary uh, Paul Mandel, please go right ahead. Um, just uh, not a question, but one of the things that uh, Mr. Kevin uh, failed to mention that was done with the leftover capital building money was um, we addressed the long overdue um, installation of uh, safety rails at all the balconies and the porta cochers at the entrances to the Capitol building. That was in conjunction between a uh, coordinated effort between admin, historical society, and the cap board. So those were all created and it had been long overdue. The cap board had looked at these over the years. And so those were all installed as part of that repair. Thank you, Mr. Mandel. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Senator Sunjum, good to see you. Please go uh, right ahead. Am, am I muted? I can hear you just oh, fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, a very simple request. Uh, thank you, Madam, Madam and Lieutenant Governor. Uh, Mr. Gubin, you mentioned uh, some uh, figures as the start of your presentation, which added up to $309 million. Uh, 
Would, would it be possible just to get a kind of a, a breakdown of those? I mean, and you went through the whole litany. Of course, I didn't write it down, but uh, maybe just a little memo on the incremental financing of, of the capital for us, just to, or, you know, for general general information. Mr. Gibbon. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Sam Jim, it is in the report as well, uh, year oh, by okay. year. I'm sorry. Yep, I'm year sorry. by year. Bye. Thank you. We'll you, pick it off welcome. there. Thanks. Let me double check. I, it, it is. Yes, it is in the report. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Governor. Thank you, Senator. Are there any other questions with the, the update? Otherwise, I'm going to keep us moving here. OK, thank you uh, for that. Um, all right, so uh, the next item on our agenda is to review the Capital Preservation Commission's annual report. Um, and Mr. Given will uh, walk us through uh, that as uh, as well. So please go right ahead, uh, Mr. Given. And at the end, we'll open it up for, uh, for additional questions. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and go into the report uh, that we uh, wrapped up last week. And I'll go page by page. It's a pretty simple report. We're still fairly fresh off of the restoration, so there aren't any real surprises in the report at this point, I'm happy to report. So just taking a look at the report uh, inside the front cover, that would be page two of the report. It states uh, the statutory requirement for the report. And then also there's a little note down at the bottom that states that the report is focused on the building, its components and the infrastructure. There's really no discussion of fine art or any of the furnishings within the building. It's uh, basically the building and its infrastructure. Going to the next page, which would be next uh, page three in the report, it lists the table of contents. Uh, going to the next two pages, pages four and five, uh, it, uh, the report outlines uh, in the introduction section, the commission membership and who's on the committee or commission, sorry. The remainder two pages uh, outline in just in general terms, uh, the responsibilities of the commission. It's just excerpts of the statute. Also on page five, it's item number 8B towards the end of the write up there, it actually specifies the need or the, the statutory requirement for the report itself. Moving on to page six, uh, states the current facility index of the building itself. Okay, uh, so right now we are at a 0 0.03, which is a rating of excellent. And I'll, I'll just uh, kind of talk for a couple of seconds about this whole process that we use for uh, doing a for calculating the condition index it's a industry standard it's used by many federal and other states as well so it's a well-known uh, standard and we have a trained assessors in facilities management these people are from architectural and engineering backgrounds and they take a look at the building every year all of our buildings actually and it's requirement for all state facilities where they are fully assessed and the raters rate uh, the condition of the various components of the building and they come up with a score from one to five uh, there's also uh, cost estimates for the components of the building that are developed uh, through RS means, which is a large uh, estimating service that architects and engineers typically use. And there's an logarithm that has been created through the facility condition assessment process, and we come up with an overall score. And so uh, that is where that 0 0.03 comes from. And it would be expected that the building is still in excellent condition. It hasn't changed at all from last year. And we did the assessment this past August. And uh, so it still remains in excellent condition. Um, the report on that same page six also uh, outlines our role in facilities management, uh, how we, even though we had the pandemic this year, we were here every day, we are here every day, uh, and we are keeping the buildings running. And so we were on site uh, inspecting and, and, and uh, making sure things are operating properly and performing the preventative maintenance. We follow a maintenance guide that was developed by the architects and engineers and the construction manager uh, who did the restoration 
Uh, they put that together as part of the requirement for the project. And that's what we use as our guide. Plus, we also use our own expertise because we do have anything from you know, master electricians and plumbers to architects uh, and uh, engineers on our staff. Um, it went through an interesting it was an interesting year uh, for the Capitol building. It saw a lot less in the way of visitors and, and occupancy volume because of the coronavirus. But it also saw a lot of people, too. Uh, earlier in the year when we had the threat of uh, civil unrest, uh, there were several hundred National Guard and DPS officers uh, that were in the building uh, actually sleeping there. It was a big dormitory for several days. We also did install a fence around the building uh, to help protect it. Uh, the latest value based on our facility assessment is $695 million worth of real estate there that uh, we are trying to ensure does not get damaged uh, and that the inhabitants of that building stay safe as well. So we put the fence there back in May and there's a little excerpt in the report about the fence. Um, this year, we did do a full exterior assessment of the building. We had drones flying around it. Uh, we didn't have to have scaffolding or put people hanging on ropes from the dome. We're using uh, drone technology now to take close looks at the, uh, at the upper uh, elements of the building. So we talk a little bit about that. Moving on to page seven. Uh, one of the things uh, we have been doing for all of the facilities is continual disinfection in the building. So our staff is there disinfecting several times a day. Uh, we have seen, it's been very limited, but we have seen some impacts of using the disinfectant on some of the surfaces. We have noticed that, noticed that the marble rail uh, around the rotunda and some of the wood railings in the building are dulling a little bit because of the disinfectant. So we did consult with uh, Minnesota Historical Society and their conservatives. They came out and take, took a look, and they recommend that we go to a different disinfectant, which was the original disinfectant we had been using on the building. But because of the coronavirus, we wanted to increase the effectiveness of the disinfectant, a lower dwell time on surfaces to kill the virus faster. And so it's a slightly more acidic uh, disinfectant. Uh, that we were using, but we have gone back to the other, which has a slightly longer dwell time. It's still an effective disinfectant, but rather than five minutes, it's a 10 minute dwell time on the surfaces. So uh, the conservators are not, they understand uh, that we had to take these measures. Uh, they don't see that, uh, you know, we, we don't think it's such a remarkable uh, de degra degradation from the surface that it detracts, but it's just noticeable that it's a little duller. My hope is that once we get people back in the building, the hand oils will shine it back up and it'll look like it used to. But uh, there's no structural impacts there. And we are using, again, a, a less uh, uh, harsh disinfectant or less effective, dis less harsh disinfectant is what I like to say. Moving on to page eight. Talks a little bit about uh, the funding for the building. It's kind of unique. Uh, you know, facilities management, Department of Admin, uh, we, we charge rent in all of our facilities. That's how we're funded. Our operations and maintenance uh, costs are funded uh, for the department. Uh, and that's the, kind of the same thing for the capital. We set lease rates every couple of years. MMB appro uh, approves them. But for certain spaces on the capital, the ceremonial space, uh, services for the blind space um, and the legislative space, there's actually an appropriation that is established that is, is a, a direct appropriation to the Department of Admin and then facilities management charges to that account. And again, the allocations or the budget for that are established much like they are for all the agencies. It's based on what our lease rates are going to be for the next biennium. So that's how we receive the money uh, for the Capitol building. So for 20, uh, FY21, we have about 9.89 million uh, in, the, uh, in lieu of rent account. And we've asked for 10.5 million for the next biennium, FY22 and 23. Um, it is important to us in facilities management and admin that the account be fully funded because that does enable us to keep the building up the way that it should be kept up. You know, the building, uh, there's been a lot of parts of the building that have been improved, the air handling systems, there's more public space in there. And so therefore, you know, it, it, has, it has required an increase in the ILR funding over the past couple of years. 
to, to be able to maintain that space. And so we are just asking for your support to help ensure that um, we, we, we receive full funding in that account so that we can continue the work that we're doing. Um, ILR does not pay for the capital investment work. So someday when we de do need to go in and, and, and do some major significant repairs, we would have to ask for bonding money. Uh, within the next five years, we don't see any need at this point for that, but someday we'll have to do that. We'll also probably have to ask for significant more funding in ILR from time to time to take care of major maintenance items. You know, eventually we're going to have to repaint the windows on that building. And that's going to be a pretty expensive cost. So that's kind of maintenance work. You could go either way with how that's funded. You could say, well, it's part of asset preservation. It's bondable. Or you could say we could use ILR because it's strictly maintenance. Painting is maintenance type work. So we could go either way with having to increase the account when we need to do that in the future. All right. So that's page eight. Page nine. Uh, kind of continues the conversation about ILR, and I just mentioned that it talks about periodic increases in the account so that we can do the larger maintenance item or, again, ask for bonding money if we need it. Page 10 uh, talks about the major systems that uh, receive day-to-day -day preventative maintenance that FMD, uh, Facilities Management, takes care of, the air handling systems, uh, you know, uh, the fire alarm systems, all of that. That's, that's really what we do in facilities management and we're there day-to-day -day taking care of those, uh, both in accordance with the maintenance guide that was set aside by the, the uh, construction crew as well as, as our expertise as well. Uh, the page also talks about what we're going to do this year. We're already doing the paint survey. We're going to do another outer skin survey as well. Moving on pay to page 11, we've pretty much already talked about that. Uh, this talks about the remaining funds, how much there are, and what we're using them for. So I'll, so it's just outlined there in page 11 that has the allocations per year uh, of the bonding money that we received. Um, page 12 talks about the non-restoration funds that we did this year or non-restoration type projects that we did, the elevator, shaft cleaning, pigeon removal, cleaning the drapes, those types of things. Not pigeon removal, but the pigeon droppings, which is, we thought we had solved that problem. <laughs> is that we've got netting everywhere up there, but they're still finding places to roost. And so it's a continual issue uh, that we try to get in there every other month or so. To, to clean that up. Uh, page 13 is our five-year maintenance plan. So this comes from mostly the exterior studies that we do on the building. Um, so uh, when the assessors go out there, they'll find some things that might need to be taken care of. And that's what this list is composed of. Uh, we also do have a wedge in there for um, the decorative paint work that will need to be done. And we've asterisked there that we would plan to use, hope to use restoration money. And I also have a wedge. I moved it from 2024 to 2025 for window repainting. You know, when we put the windows in, they said, well, you know, seven to 10 years, you're going to have to repaint them, but they're still looking good. So we'll push them as, as long as we can before we really need to get in there and paint them. But that's going to be pretty pricey. So it's, it's out in, I believe, the 25 year now. Um, moving on to page 14, uh, talks about, uh, projected funding needs. Again, at this point, uh, if ILR is funded fully, we believe we have enough funds to continue the course, to take care of those things that come up every year, uh, on the assessment and keep the building in good working order. And, um, Really, that's about it. Uh, there is one excerpt on page 14 that talks about the Art Advisory Committee at the bottom half of that. And so uh, we did have uh, an RFP out for proposals uh, that were, were received just before the uh, coronavirus hit. Uh, and we still have over 60 proposals for another, for the next uh, art installation in the building. Uh, as soon as coronavirus is to the point where we believe we can um, have an art exhibit, uh, we will ask the proposers to revalidate the proposal and then we'll bring recommendations to this commission for the next uh, installment of art. There was a, an installment that had been put in just before the coronavirus um, and it was taken down through the, uh, over the summer. 
Um, but it was there. They had a grand opening and there were a lot of visitors and it was well received, but it is now gone. There's nothing there now. And then the back cover lists the committee members. And that is the end of the report. And I probably ran over. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Given. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I appreciate that and I appreciate you walking it through it. Yeah. And I, I sort of had to catch my breath for a moment as you were talking about the disinfectant on the railing and and uh, um, so I'm glad that we have have resolved that and uh, it's a little creepy to think about people's hands o hand oils <laughs> restoring the, the capital but I um, I appreciate that and the thoughtfulness um, and the clarification of pigeon removal so thank you for that um, so let's uh, go right ahead to uh, Senator Rest. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Lieutenant Governor. Um, with I have two questions, one with regard to the L IRR, ILR, and then to just um, generally, what is your estimate of the cost savings um, to um, the uh, general maintenance funds of having the, bill, uh, the building not accessible to uh, members of the public? Certainly there is a cost that is associated when we have hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people coming into the um, building every year. So I'm assuming that even though it's not a um, one for one cost savings, that there has been some. And is that going to show up on your um, on your uh, budget sheets when you come before the legislature? And and the same question actually too with the um, in lieu of rent, um, the um, uh, the, the legislature is um, uh, a tenant, and um, uh, but we have um, in the last at least seven months um, uh, seldom used the building. <laughs> and um, what cost savings are you going to provide for the Senate budget um, in terms of the uh, revised ILR? Um, going uh, forward, even though we're hoping, of course, that there will be uh, uh, start to be increased use of, of the building and eventually when people are vaccinated, et cetera, that the building will return to full public mm -hmm. use. But in the mm -hmm. meantime, there are indeed cost savings. Um, what are they and how did you go about estimating them? Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Mr. Given. Uh, Senate, uh, Lieutenant Governor, Senator Rest. Uh, actually, it's not what you might think. Um, our staff has been there every day. We have been at work every day maintaining these buildings. And the buildings are actually running longer now because of the coronavirus. Typically, uh, during the off session times, the building runs from eight in the morning until five at night, the air handling systems. We run that building 24-5 because we don't know who's in there. The building is locked. It's not closed. And so there are people that are working in that building. We don't know necessarily where these people go. So we disinfect everywhere, all of the surfaces. So our staff has been fully here. There's probably been a little bit, le well, I would say the electrical cost uh, is probably, if not less, probably more because, you know, there's not as much plug load on the building. We don't have all of the computers running necessarily, but that air handler is running and it's running around the clock to keep that air moving as per CDC guidelines. So while there may be some minor savings that would be reflected in the buildings we make to the ILR, but it's not like there's a wholesale reduction because the building's not occupied. It, it, we are treating it as an occupied building. We don't necessarily have as much trash, but instead of hauling trash, we're disinfecting four to six times a day because we don't know where people go. And you've got to hit those bathrooms. You've got to hit those doorknobs. Um, and so therefore it's kind of a balance. So Lieutenant Governor, so when we uh, return to the situation of having thousands of people coming through the Capitol, there will be no increase in maintenance costs or anything because um, you're already doing it as if they were already there. And I, I'm just uh, trying to get a handle on it. I, I certainly um, 
appreciate um, that you're trying to keep the building disinfected even even if there are only um, by comparison only by comparison only instead of thousands there may be several dozen at most um, but that is a that is a a magnitude that um, should be reflected in the in the costs and I'm assuming that you when when people are back in the building, whether it is just members of the Senate and our staff, members of the House and their staff, that um, you're not going to cut back on um, uh, disinfecting um, maybe even more times um, going into the bathrooms, whether they've been used or not. Um, I'm I, I, assuming that there will be no um, use of the Raskeller, uh, no food service. Um, um, because that's really, that's kind of mm -hmm. like a restaurant. <laughs> We're not doing that yet. Um, mm -hmm. But um, somewhere there, there's got to there's got to be a, a balance. And when there are going to be hundreds of people, even hundreds now, with the return of the legislature, and most of us hope that it will be safe enough um, for us to um, return in person. Um, but um, I'm just um, I'm. I'm concerned about um, uh, when we return, do the costs go up <laughs> um, uh, when um, um, uh, uh, and will your activities be any different for a couple of hundred more people in the in the capital than there are now for a couple of dozen and um, I'm sorry that just seems to me that there there is a, a, um, a fiscal Im implication uh, for the maintenance of the building. And as we gradually reopen it, um, the same thing. We probably still are going to want to disinfect um, because we don't know that the, the virus doesn't tell us <clears throat> what it's going to be doing in the, um, um, in the next several months. Um, and it may come back with a roar. So Thank you for that. Comment? Could yeah, you thank comment? you for that, Senator. Um, uh, Mr. Given. Uh, Senator Rest, uh, Lieutenant Governor. Yes, I mean, you know, some of the impacts, which one thing we haven't seen through the corona is overtime. You know, a lot of time we, we spend a significant amount of year uh, during session, especially on overtime, because our people stay until the session is over. And so therefore, you know, that element is not there and partially it's it's probably been offset by other things. Um, so absolutely. Point, pardon me. Go right ahead. Yeah, there, uh, so so anyway, you know, uh, it. It still remains to be seen. I mean, when we go into session, if if we still do need indeed to to disinfect is uh, on the same frequency cycle as we are now, that could have labor impacts. And, um, you know, uh, you know, we'll just have to take it as it comes, whether it's overtime or something else. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, uh, I just want, you know, just a final comment that we are going to be looking very, very um, carefully um, at um, at budgets for the House and for the Senate, um, um, for admin, for the governor's office, and how you know everyone that is in works in the Capitol that is going to be coming back to normal um, activity as much as we can, as soon as we can. Um, when when the budgets come before us. We want to make um, educated and thoughtful uh, decisions. And so having uh, an analysis of costs like this um, could be very helpful uh, uh, to us. So I, I appreciate your attention to the mm -hmm. detail. And um, thank you, Mr. Givens and, yeah. um, and, uh, and Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Senator Rest. And, and I think that that's an important uh, important thing for us to consider, and uh, it'll be uh, critical that that this uh, uh, committee is is kept in the loop on on those developments. Uh, so thank you, uh, Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, Senator Rest asked many of my questions about uh, ILR, but I just have a couple others uh, to to add to that. 
Um, one, uh, is there, and I'll just ask them both at the same time. Uh, one is I'm wondering if there's a carryover uh, in the ILR. In other words, if all of the maintenance funding is not necessary in one year, is it? are you able to carry that over to the next biennial budget uh, without losing that? I think that's important to know. Um, and then the second uh, item um, had to do with uh, kind of along the same lines again as Senator Ress, but my question was, um, because of the $310 million of massive and much needed restoration, which we are so thankful for, I wanted to know also how that impacted the maintenance budget, in other words, the ILR needs, uh, because it would um, intuitively, one would think, um, the um, immediate maintenance needs would be much less because of the massive uh, restoration. That's not to say we won't need that ongoing, and that is the best way to protect our investment, is um, proper, immediate, adequate, um, timely maintenance. But it just seems to me that intuitively, there would be a reduction in uh, maintenance needs uh, as we are so near the $310 million restoration. So if you could comment on both the carryover and the impact of the restoration on the maintenance needs as are reflected in the ILR. Mr. Gibbon. Lieutenant Governor and Senator Nelson, um, thank you. Uh, the ILR, and I, I will verify, ILR does not carry between over bienniums. And if there's anybody in the admin crew that wants to uh, comment if I'm wrong, then certainly uh, they can do so, but it does not carry over. Um, mm -hmm. With regards to maintenance costs uh, with re as a result of the restoration, certainly we have much more efficient systems in the building, but overall the cost is actually a little bit more because we're pushing so much air through the building before we had, you know, several areas of that building where air was not moving. We've got air handlers now that that push so much more air through the facility. We have sophisticated fire alarm systems now, smoke detection systems up in the rotunda that we, uh, up in the dome that we didn't have before, air evacuation systems that all have to be maintained, inspected a couple of times a year. We have a lot more public space now up on the third floor that we didn't have before that uh, just requires uh, more changeover cleaning. And so, you know, the maintenance costs have, have probably reduced in unit by a, a certain amount, but overall, I, we've actually increased the ILR, the ILR functions because of the fact that we have to keep, we have a guide now to keep the building up that we did not have before. So we are actually making a much better um, progress on keeping the building new. We're pushing a lot more air through the facility. There's more sophistication there. Lighting, for instance, you know, most of the lighting in there is LED, but there's so much more of it. It's so much better lit now. All of the exterior lighting, that's all part of the security system there. The new security systems on lot N, the bollards, all of that, those are all things we didn't have to maintain before. And so it's not like there was a large reduction uh, in maintenance costs because of the restoration. What we've got in there is the, the most efficient that you can get in today's standards. There's no doubt, it's an efficient building but there's more of it and so um that's probably it's kind of washing your question but it's not like we're saving a bunch of money uh on the building it's just more things to do because of it you know we do the exterior stint skin studies every year now we didn't do that it had been many years uh since we had done something like that where we're actually doing uh those things that need to be done to keep it as good as we can Hmm. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, uh, uh, just go right ahead. I want to just note that we are at 1130 and I want to continue to move us along. But Senator, uh, please ask your question. Well, uh, just a, a, a follow up. I'll um, it'd be interesting to really kind of uh, look into that. I understand there is much more in many things, but but things are much more um, 
uh, less expensive to operate as well. And so um, anyway, I, I appreciate the good care you're taking of the building and those those uh, skin studies, all of those studies are so important, but it just doesn't quite add up that the maintenance uh, would, and, and it seems that maintenance uh, maybe should be able to roll over because you're not going to spend the same amount every year probably, but uh, enough for, for today. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I want to go to Chief Justice Gilday uh, here. Uh, Chief Justice. Yes, I think I'm, I think my technology is, I just had a couple of of typos that I found in the oh, report, which I don't know if it's you. too late to tell you about those or not. Um, Chief Justice, it is never too late it's to never fix too late. typos. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so on page six, in the paragraph that begins during periods of the threatened civil unrest, you need a period at the end of that sentence. Yes, Madam Chief Justice. And then on page 14, the Capital Preservation Commission share, I think it should be shares. Page 14. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is that the third paragraph there? Madam yes, Chief the Justice? Capital Preservation Commission share. We caught that shares? one. So OK, good. Thank we you. That that's one. all I that's all I have. And I'm probably going to sign off here in a little bit to go to another meeting. But thanks, everybody, and happy holidays. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Chief Justice. And that is exactly the thorough uh, review that I would expect from the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in Minnesota. So thank you uh, for that. Um, Senator Sunjum, go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, that was pretty good. I'm impressed. <laughs> I, my question, uh, Mr. Gibbon, d d deals with, you know, we've spent a lot of money on certainly the, and appropriately so on the capital, the capital grounds and so on and so forth. And this this may be out of south outside of our jurisdiction, but I'm just going to ask anyway. Uh, having spent all that money, uh, frankly, if you drive down Cedar Street, you're driving down a washboard, uh, in my opinion. And I'm just talking about street condition. And is the street condition uh, is that part of uh, the capital responsibility, or do we do we have to tweak the city of St. Paul on that, or? Uh, I mean, just perceptibly, you know, you got this wonderful capital. You're driving up the hill, and uh, and you're you're trying to avoid potholes and, and things like that. Is there anything we could do about that? Thank you, Senator. Mr. Given, uh, Madam Chief, uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Governor, and uh, Senator Senjum, uh, those are city streets. However, uh, we will send the city a letter and ask them if we can get some pavement because you're right, it's uh, pretty rough down on MLK, Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. But the uh, the city is And I would say Cedar Street, too, in front of the, and, in front of the Centennial Building, especially. It's it's so, it's a washboard-like. Absolutely. And the Cedar Street Bridge has got some pretty good potholes as well. So we'll approach them. We know that they're, uh, they've got some tough times, but we'll let them know. And, and on behalf of the city, uh, to the commission, they do provide us really good support. Uh, they, they, keep, they are responsible for plowing the streets. Those are their sidewalks. However, we maintain the sidewalks. Our grounds crew goes ahead and does that. But the city, if they know we've got something going on down on the mall, they're down there sweeping and, and they try to give us good service. But you're right, the pavement leaves a little to be desired. And so we'll, uh, we'll ask them if we can get some support. And Madam Chair, this is for another day and for a larger discussion. But you know, I, with with that two point uh, two million dollars, I mean, I mean, my my vote would be to help the city of St. Paul if we needed to uh, on those streets with some of that money. <laughs> Thank Noted. you. Noted. Thank you, uh, Senator Sunjum. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, Representative Erdahl, please go right ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan, and uh, I'd just like to say that uh, uh, and thank uh, Mr. Gibbons for the work being done. Uh, I'm I'm impressed that really this is the way the the commission is supposed to be uh, operating. Um, when this commission was created in the uh, Legacy Bill of, of 2011, uh, the purpose was to restore the capital, and to through that commission oversee the restoration of the capital. And uh, obviously, uh, you know, 
tremendous job was done with the uh, with the capital restoration. But when it was over, and I guess I'm giving a little bit of a history lesson here, uh, when it was over, uh, the concern was without oversight, without having a, a commission like this established, uh, we were in danger of running into situations where once again, uh, the condition of the capital reached a critical stage. And so the purpose of this uh, commission uh, has been to uh, you know, provide some oversight and uh, to guide a, a little bit what happens in the future, uh, again, to avoid these dire circumstances. And uh, I'm very impressed that uh, today and, and in the past uh, couple of years, uh, the commission has been uh, act, um, actively working in that role and I, I think uh, doing what the uh, legislation intended it to do. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Erdahl, and um, you can always give us a history lesson. That's kind of your gig. I, I appreciate it. Um, okay, so uh, we talked about the report, uh, made some changes, um, and so I just want to make sure that uh, folks feel okay about approving the 2021 Capital Preservation Commission annual report. Lieutenant Governor, do you want a motion? I think so. Uh, this is a little. Um, this I, this I move yes. that the Capital Preservation Commission um, um, receive the report. Um, uh, I think it's a better motion than to say approve of it, but that we're we're receiving it um, as um, as corrected. Thank you, Senator. Is there a second? Here. Thank you, Representative. All those in favor, please say aye. Uh, discussion. Aye. Discussion. Oh, I'm sorry. Aye. Thank you, uh, Representative Murphy. Uh, absolutely, uh, Representative Murphy. Uh, I will call for discussion. Any discussion? I have a discussion. Yes, Re Representative Murphy. Go right ahead. Um, Representative, uh, we receive with the words "receive the report." Is this a report to the commission or is this a report the commission makes to the people of Minnesota? Mr. Given. Uh, Lieutenant Governor um, and members of the committee, this is the committee's report to the legislature and the bodies having jurisdiction over finance, funding, and some of the ways and means. So it's our re your report to them. The commission's report to the legislature. Then, then, Lieutenant Governor, I agree with um, Representative Murphy, and perhaps the, the motion is better that we receive the report and forward it to um, the legislative legislature and the appropriate uh, committee jurisdictions. That makes sense to me. Representative Murphy? Well, that I think that's a better wording of it, but Representative Erdahl talked about in in the past uh, between the, between the time that the commission was formed and um, the 2018 legislation that requires this report in particular because the the capital has been restored. My question is. Do we have quarter, does this commission have quarterly meetings or just the meeting to receive the report in the future? In the future, does this commission have quarterly meetings or does this commission just receive the report rather than create the report? Uh, my understanding uh, is that this meeting is uh, to occur in statute uh, once per year. Uh, and so uh, that's that is what I know. Mr. Given, do you uh, have anything else to, to add here? 
uh, Lieutenant Governor, yeah, inside the front cover, it talks about it. It says is required by the statute 2018, 15B32. It says the, the commission shall report to the chairs and ranking minority members and legislative committees with jurisdiction over state government. Um, it doesn't talk about meeting frequency. It's just an annual report that the commission has to report to the legislature. Representative Murphy. Thank you. Uh, when, oh, uh, Mr. Givens, just let me ask this Please. question then. Yes, you're saying that you're going to activate the art uh, art components and the there's a art commission, I believe that you're going or you're going to review. Um, there's some 90 or 60 or however many uh, entries or possible entries to have art um, shown at the Capitol and so forth. Um, is there any other purpose for this commission besides to review the artwork then, or the, I imagine you would report to this commission with the art, with the decisions about the art stuff and the furniture stuff in the Capitol. But is uh, there any other is there any other responsibility of this commission than to receive the department and administration's report to the legislature? Mr. Given, go ahead. But before yeah. you do, I'm going to ask Senator Nelson. Uh, can you stop sharing your screen? Sorry, um, <laughs> I do that. That's I what it is. Sometimes too. Um, so there we go. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no biggie. So members of the committee, the commission, uh, you know, the commission is there, you know, we to, to review the report, make recommendations. You know, we've got right now, you know, the building is, is well maintained. It's still like new. But as time goes on, the commission will certainly be much more involved when we 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 bring you. Uh, issues that are occurring with the Capitol building and we make decisions on how to proceed with that. Right now, we've got adequate, we're, we're able to take care of the, the work that needs to be done in the building. And so we're almost on like an autopilot where we're doing those things we need to do to ensure we can do that. But this committee will, commission will become very important as we come to you with, a, I don't know, a $5 million requirement that has to be taken care of out there. That's what this committee or commission to be charged with. Um, and making those decisions when we don't have enough money and what are we not gonna do? You know, hey. and those are on the horizon. I think right now we're in good shape. I, the building's new and there's just not a lot of things going wrong with it. And, but that will change over time. And that's where this committee is gonna be so important when we're making those decisions and deciding deliberately what we do and what we don't do until we get the money and how we ask for the money. Because part of the, the the charter, the legislature says, you know, we will provide legislative uh, uh, draft uh, legislation as necessary to do what we need to do on the building. So that it, it will, it's just right now things are kind of easy, um, but that'll change with time. And Mr. Mr. Given and, and Representative Murphy, I would just say that I am certainly open to this commission uh, meeting more frequently. Um, my my fear is that we will get to the point where suddenly we need to weigh in uh, and it becomes fast and furious um, and, you know, giving ourselves uh, a little bit of uh, regularity in these conversations is um, is, uh, I think, a good thing. Um, so I would just uh, would just mention that um, as well. Representative Murphy, did you have anything else to add, or I can go uh, next? I think to to Representative Erdahl. No, I would just like to thank the Commissioner of Administration for sending me a copy of the uh, report. I appreciate that very much. I got it Saturday, oh, good. so I Very ran good. it before today. <laughs> well, of course, you did. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Representative. Representative Erdahl, please go right ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Lieutenant Governor. And uh, just to, uh, I guess, add a little bit to that, uh, when, it, when this was set up, it was basically intended to be once a year 
to take the uh, the report. But then if we chose to make specific other recommendations or uh, remove something, we have the authority to do that. Uh, however, uh, we also can, as uh, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan suggested, uh, the fact that we are meeting once a year does not preclude that we can't meet more if decisions need to be made or we choose to. So I understand. Uh, just clarifying a little bit. And uh, Lieutenant Governor, yes. one, one final thing. There will be some there will be some kind of a presentation at some point on these uh, proposals for art. We're not just going to make that decision here. So that would be a time when the commission would be pulled together to to get the recommendations on what the next exhibits are going to be uh, in the building. So they'll be a quote unquote out of cycle uh, meeting as soon as coronavirus uh, allows. Thank you, uh, Mr. Given. Uh, Senator Rest. Oh, Senator Rest, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. The reason why I made the motion to receive and forward um, is because this report contains financial information. And when a board approves a report that has financial information in it, uh, my training tells me that they become responsible for it. And um, it, um, it's a formality, but it it protects the members of the commission um, with regard to financial information. Not that it cannot be verified, but we have not undertaken that. So the 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 general the general motion for any organization that has audited statements or or receives report with financial information as it and it is to um, receive um, and then in this case to um, um, to forward. So I, I do think that's the appropriate motion. Thank you. And I renew it. Excellent. Right this second <laughs> so it can be done. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Uh, the Senator renews her motion. Uh, and is there a second? I second. Thank you, Representative Murphy. All those in favor, please say aye. Excuse me. I, aye. I got, oh, oh, got Repres <laughs> Representative one, Rudolph. Sorry, before this is approved, one very important change needs to be made. There's a correction at the very end. Ooh. My name is spelled wrong. Oh, my. See, there you go. Oh. There's, <laughs> there's an extra H in there, so excuse me for saying this, but we need to get the H out of there. <laughs> Uh, we can we can can make that change. Uh, Senator Rust, would you make that motion uh, with that, that change? Uh, thank you, um, thank you. Uh, Madam Lieutenant Governor and um, uh, and uh, Representative Erdahl. And I would include in my motion um, any additional um, uh, technical corrections that need to be made to the report that we uh, authorize um, Mr. Givens to uh, to do so before the report is forwarded to the legislature. I include that in my motion. Thank you. And there was a second by Representative Murphy. Representative Murphy, you second? Yes. Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Excellent. Uh, the report Bye. is approved. Thank you so much. Um, we have a last uh, a business agenda item, um, which is a brief update um, from Secretary uh, Mandel, Executive Secretary Mandel. Um, and so uh, Executive Secretary Mandel, I would ask you to just be very brief if you could, um, and we can send uh, additional information uh, to members. In fact, there are a, a couple of members um, who uh, serve on the commission who also serve uh, on uh, the task forces. And so, uh, but please uh, go right ahead to just present the work of the advisory uh, task forces. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there are two task forces. These are both advisory to the Capital Area Architectural Planning Board. One is the Public Engagement Advisory Task Force. Um, they are looking at um, using their own networks to solicit from their uh, circles and outstate greater Minnesota and whatever, um, how people feel about the Capitol, 
the artwork at the Capitol, mostly focused on the uh, what's outside the Capitol uh, on the Capitol grounds, um, how to make it more inclusive, what they see missing, what they love, how they feel at home. There's also a public, I'm sorry, decision process advisory task force that is examining our policies and procedures. We have no policy regarding how or when to remove something from the Capitol grounds. We have been installing memorials and monuments, but we don't have anything to remove. So the standards and policies, and they're trying to make the whole policy document more accessible. So they are going through editing on that. There are 15 members to each task force and they'll be reporting back to the cap board by end of the spring with recommendations after which the cap board will take up those recommendations and decide what to do with them. How's that, Madam Chair? That was beautiful. Thank you uh, very much. We will provide additional information for folks if they need it. Um, but what I would also just say is to make it abundantly clear, these task forces um, are advisory in nature. They do not uh, make any formal decisions. Those recommendations will go to the cap board to make those decisions. Um, and so, but we are, are grateful and grateful for the folks who serve on the commission who are also playing that role uh, in serving in those task forces to make sure that our beautiful capital is a welcoming place uh, for everyone who visits as it is their, uh, their home. Um, if are there any questions for uh, Executive Secretary Mandel? If not, I'm just going to keep moving us right along. OK, so uh, Executive Secretary, we'll look forward uh, to uh, uh, any additional information that you want to share with us. That wraps our final agenda item today. Are there any other issues that members would like to address or bring forward at this time? Okay, seeing none, thank you all for uh, your work and for the attention to detail as we uh, reviewed the annual report today. Um, what I would just say is I appreciate this uh, discussion. I appreciate being part of this commission um, and so much of the leadership that has happened uh, leading us into this moment where we find ourselves. I'm grateful uh, for the many folks who are on this commission who have been uh, in this work. Uh, and so my job, I think, as the vice chair, and I'll talk to my friend, the governor, uh, will also be to determine uh, what makes sense with regards to uh, continuing uh, to keep this commission uh, apprised and engaged on, on the, the issues that are, are coming forward. So we're not waiting until we absolutely need folks uh, to weigh in because we may be uh, in a tough spot but to have this ongoing um, uh, communication and determining what, what frequency makes uh, the most sense. So with that, um, uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for uh, your sharing your, your time and your talents uh, with us. And I hope uh, that you get a bit of downtime over the holidays uh, to refresh. Um, goodness knows I certainly need it, uh, but also to take care of yourselves um, as we go into uh, work together in, in 2021. So take good care, everyone. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>